All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 13. Acts 13, the Bibles in front of you are available for your use. Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. And this morning is the first sermon in our new five-part series in Acts entitled The Gospel Mission in Asia. As we have now seen the disciples of Jesus be faithful to the call and the mission that Jesus gave to them in his final moments with them, namely that great commission that they were to be his witnesses and that the Holy Spirit was going to give them the power that they needed to testify to Jesus to more and more people groups, to the Jewish people, to the Samaritan people who were partly Jewish, and then to the Gentile people, like most of us sitting here in this room this morning, who have zero connection to the lineage of the Jewish people, those who came from that line of Abraham and the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament. And Jesus' apostles and his disciples were faithful to the call that Jesus gave to them to spread the gospel to each one of these people groups. And as men, women, and children from within each group were indeed receiving and believing the message of salvation, repenting of their sin, and putting their faith and trust in Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, God was revealing that in fact his church was not going to be limited to one sort of people. That it wasn't to be established based upon those categories of rich or poor, young or old, male or female. That it wasn't to be established based upon race or ethnicity or socioeconomic status. No, the gospel was to be for all people, to every tongue and tribe and nation, so that those who made up the church of Jesus Christ were united by one single characteristic. That we put our faith and our hope and our trust in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ for us. That he is our hope, he is our life, and it is for his glory that we now live, both as individuals throughout our week and in our life together as the church. And so now that the gospel has gone out to the Gentiles and has been clearly shown to be for all people, The rest of the book of Acts is going to show us how the church was faithful to the call to spread the gospel to all nations, beginning first in this region of Asia. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God, for what scripture says, God says, wherever you're at this morning, if you're able, I invite you to rise with me as we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, Acts 13, we'll read verses 1 through 12 this morning. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamus and said, You are a child of the devil. And an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time. And you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him. And he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. This is God's holy and infallible word for you today. Let's pray together. Father, the grass withers and the flowers fade. 
but the word of our God stands forever. Your word cannot fail. Indeed, it will not fail. For you, as its author, preserve it for your people to the very end. So use your word to do in us what you desire to do today. And we pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. And together we say, amen. Please be seated. Pastor John Piper is quoted as having said this, that missions exists because worship doesn't. That missions exists because worship doesn't. And that quote was extremely helpful for me in gaining a proper perspective for what missions is all about and why missions ought to matter deeply to Jesus' disciples and to Jesus' church. And a few weeks ago, we had two of our own missionaries, Tommy and Ariana Burke, join us for that service and share with us the mission work that God is doing through them in Albania. Tommy's family actually moved to Dearborn the summer before his senior year of high school, and so I got to have Tommy for one year in lifeguards, and I would have never guessed that the Lord would put his call upon Tommy's life to move overseas and give himself to a life of gospel missions for the sake of God's glory being spread through the people of Albania, and yet that is the very thing that Tommy is now doing, and we as a church get to support them through our prayers and our financial commitments. Tommy, like many, many others, has sensed the Holy Spirit do in his life the very thing we see the Holy Spirit do in our passage today, as he, the person of the Holy Spirit, set apart Barnabas and Saul and called them to go to a place that was not their home in order to take the gospel message to a people that needed to hear it and believe it. And my hope and prayer for Dearborn Christian Fellowship is that we would become a church where our people, both young and old alike, are also sensing the Holy Spirit's call upon us to go and to give our life to missions, to go to unreached people groups, to go to unreached places for the sake of taking the gospel to image bearers of God who need to hear it and believe it. But for that to be the case, I am also praying that the parents of Dearborn Christian Fellowship would be encouraging their children to prayerfully consider the Holy Spirit's call of missions upon their life as urgently and as passionately as we encourage medical school and accounting and engineering and a list of other professions. And the reason I say that and the reason that that matters so deeply is not ultimately because of missions in and of itself. No, it is ultimately for the sake of worship. As Piper said, missions exists because worship doesn't. If every image bearer of God on the earth, if every human being becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ through repentance of sin and faith in the gospel, then missions would no longer be necessary as God would be maximally worshipped by all those whom he has created. And yet missions remains necessary because God is not being worshipped and exalted and adored by all people whom he has created on the earth. And therefore God has called his people and his church to be a going people. A people who see that the mission of our life is not ultimately about building wealth and security and comfort. It's not ultimately about building our kingdoms, but rather about being a people who heed the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6, when our Lord said this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, meaning all the material possessions and things we need, will be added to you. When we seek first the kingdom of God, we do so with the desire that God's name, that the name of Jesus would be adored and exalted and worshiped maximally by the greatest number of human beings on the planet, which will also result in the greatest possible joy for all of humanity. Missions exist because worship doesn't, and maybe one day God will be maximally worshiped on this earth, and we can give up this call to missions, but until that day, this is what Jesus has called his church and his people to have a passion for and a commitment to. 
to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, starting right in the places that we live, work, and play, for the fields are ripe for a great and a plentiful harvest. And now in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, we see the beginning of the church's whole missionary era. Now, prior to chapter 13, we have certainly seen the disciples of Jesus be faithful to testify to him in all of the places that they went. And yet each of those places that they went to, they did so because of the persecution that they were facing as they were scattered into regions that they may not have gone to otherwise. But now in chapter 13, we see this new church plant up in Antioch, made up of tremendous Gentile converts to Christianity, send out missionaries of their own accord with the desire to see the gospel spread for the sake of faith and repentance and the increased worship of God's name. And so what we want to see in our text this morning is that because God's desire is for his name to be maximally exalted and worshiped, he sends his church out to proclaim the gospel on mission. And we'll develop that this morning by seeing first, the heart of the church at Antioch, second, the gospel mission on Cyprus, and then third, the transition in Paul's leadership. And so first, let's see the heart of the church at Antioch. We saw two weeks ago how the birth of this church up in Antioch occurred. Up in a very Gentile and pagan region far in the northern part of Syria, as men from Cyprus and Cyrene traveled to this place and preached the message of salvation to those who had no religious background, no spiritual understanding whatsoever, and yet we see the Holy Spirit birth faith in these Gentile image bearers of God. So that as Barnabas arrives up in Antioch to confirm this herd of faith, he rejoiced at what he saw, and he encouraged them to remain true to their Lord. We also saw Barnabas then travel up to Tarsus in order to find Saul, to bring Saul and his gift of teaching back to this newly planted church so that he could teach them well the essential truths of the Christian faith that they needed to know and believe. And so as Barnabas and Saul spent an entire year with this congregation, serving as their leaders, shepherding the people, and investing in their spiritual growth and maturity, now in chapter 13, we get to see a picture of what is true of this no longer infant, but now toddler age church, and what was true of them. And verses 2 and 3 show us that worship and fasting and prayer were at the center of their life together as a church. For this new congregation recognized how sweet their life with God was. And the response of any disciple, any church that treasures Jesus Christ and the salvation that he has granted to us, the response is to return back to God, the worship due his name to revel in his glory and majesty, to delight in the work that he has accomplished and now credited to us, and to bask in the love that God the Father has for those whom he has adopted as his own children through faith in Jesus Christ. This was the heart of the church at Antioch, and it was seen through their worship and their prayers, which grew deeper and more meaningful as Saul taught them well the truths of the scriptures, which they knew nothing about prior to their becoming Christians. And what I love about this passage is that as they grew in their knowledge of God, which led them to a deeper love for God, they began to see their lives as existing for the very glory of their God. And so as they worshiped him, they also fasted and prayed, meaning they went without food intentionally for a certain period of time, skipping meals so that they could use that time to more fervently seek out the Lord and what his desire and his will was for them in that moment as a church. And see, it was as they were fasting and seeking out God's will for them that the Holy Spirit then called and set apart Barnabas and Saul to go on what would be the first of three 
missionary journeys. Verse 2 says it this way, while they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. As these Christians from Antioch, we're fervently seeking the Lord through fasting and through prayer, desiring to know what God's will was for them. The Holy Spirit revealed that his will for them was to send out people from their midst who would go to other places where there were people that needed to hear the gospel. And so this solid, established, well-taught, integrated, multi-staffed, Worshiping and praying church is the first church that we see in the scriptures that send out missionaries to unreached people groups with the gospel. And from this text, I believe that we see this reality, that a passion for and a commitment to missions is the natural overflow of a church that fervently seeks the Lord. Why do I say that? Well, because a church that is passionate for God is a church that will be passionate for God to be worshiped. And as we said, missions exist because worship is not yet happening in a place and in a people. Now, not everyone from that church went to Cyprus. In fact, it was only Barnabas and Saul and John Mark. And yet they had now become a sending church because they were faithful to the call to send out workers into the field. Romans 10, 14 is the picture of why missions should matter so deeply to Jesus's church and to Jesus's disciples. As it says this, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Do you see the chain? How beautiful then are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so one of our stated priorities as a church is to increase our giving as a church to missions every single year. In some years, that looks like adding new missionaries onto the list of those that we as a church support. And in other years, it means increasing the amount that we are sending to the missionaries that are already on the field and doing that work. But we as a church are committed to increasing our funding to missions every year as the Lord provides for an increased budget because we want to send out those who preach the good news so that more and more people can hear. But I also want to encourage you sitting here in this room this morning, beyond just sending our money, to consider whether you may be one of those that the Holy Spirit is calling and leading to be sent out as a missionary to take the the gospel for the sake of God's name being worshiped by more and more image bearers on the earth. We want to be a going church, a people who understand that we live on mission in all of the places that we go throughout our week. But we also want to be a sending church so that Jesus' name is proclaimed to the ends of the earth. This was the heart of the church at Antioch, and I pray that it is the heart of DCF as well. Second this morning, let's see the gospel mission that happens on Cyprus. Verse 4 tells us that as the Holy Spirit sent Barnabas and Saul out, that they traveled down to the town of Seleucia, which was the port of Antioch along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. They jumped on a ship and they sailed down to the island of Tarsus. Now, Tarsus is the place that Barnabas was from originally, which is, it probably had something to do with why they went there in the first place. But as soon as they arrived on Tarsus, or on Cyprus, did I say Tarsus that whole time? Cyprus, in the city of Salamis, Far on the east end of the island, the very first thing that they did was they entered the synagogue of the Jews, 
so that they could preach the gospel to the Jews there in that place. Now, Luke doesn't actually tell us in this passage how the Jews of Salamis responded to the gospel, but this is the pattern that we see consistently in all of Paul's missionary journeys, that he would go first to proclaim the gospel to the Jews, and then also certainly to the Gentiles. And we see that pattern in Paul's writings as well, like Romans 1.16 that says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is, this, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or the Gentile. Paul would consistently enter the Jewish synagogues in the cities that he traveled to, as Paul had a passion for and a burden for seeing his Jewish brothers and sisters be saved. As he writes in Romans 9, 2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul's deep desire was for his Jewish brothers and sisters to have their blind eyes opened to the reality of Jesus Christ, just as his had been on that road to Damascus. And so he would first preach to the Jew, but then also certainly to the Gentile. As all people were now indeed called to come to Jesus Christ in faith and could be told, the gospel is indeed for you. But while Luke is silent to the response of the Jews on the island of Cyprus, the one event that he does share in detail in this passage is that of a Gentile, not a Jew, coming to faith in the gospel. And that Gentile was a man named Sergius Paulus, who was the proconsul of the city of Paphos, far on the west end of the island. And Sergius had heard of Barnabas and Saul and this message that they were spreading on his island, for as the proconsul, he was the Roman authority over this entire region, this entire island. And so Sergius invites Barnabas and Saul to come and to share their message, the, the word of God with him. And yet immediately, they were met with tremendous resistance from a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus, or Elimus, which was his other name that meant sorcerer or magician. This false prophet had worked his way into being one of the proconsul's advisors, probably by claiming that he had special powers to see into the future and so he could advise the proconsul with great wisdom. But Bar Jesus knew, and that name means son of Jesus, he knew that if his boss heard and received the message of Barnabas and Saul, it would put an end to his role and eliminate his influential position of power. And the reality is, is that much of the resistance that we see to the gospel in the world, even today, is because the gospel proves other worldviews to be false. It shows that God alone is the one that is all powerful and therefore puts human rulers and authorities in their proper place. And so it is by and large seen as a great threat to the building of our own kingdoms and the living of our lives in the way that we would desire, just as the gospel was seen as a great threat to this Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And so in his effort to turn the proconsul away from believing their message, verse 9 says this, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now, from this moment forward, as he would minister in predominantly Gentile regions, he would go by his Roman name of Paul rather than his Hebrew or Jewish name of Saul. And Paul here proclaims stark words of rebuke against this false prophet named Bar Jesus or son of Jesus, revealing that in fact what you are is the son of the devil, of the seed of that serpent. Why? Because you oppose the very work and the very power of God. See, those who are truly of God, they desire and they work to see God's will accomplished on this earth. And that begins by proclaiming that Jesus is the only hope for our salvation. 
That was the message that Barnabas and Saul shared with the proconsul. And so when Saul or Paul then declares that the, pro, that the bar Jesus is going to be struck blind and, and unable to see for a period of time because of his opposing God, as the proconsul saw those words come to pass, as bar Jesus was then groping around for someone who could lead him by the hand, verse 12 declares this, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of of the Lord. The miracle that he saw matched the message that he heard. And so this gospel mission on Cyprus resulted in the Roman Gentile proconsul coming to faith in Jesus Christ. For he saw the physical evidence that verified the message they were proclaiming. And so friends, let me challenge you this morning in this, that for most of the people that you live, work, and play around, the physical evidence that they are going to see that matches the message of hope in Christ that we proclaim is your very life. The way that we live, the way that we conduct ourselves before others is either going to validate or it's going to contradict our message of hope in what Jesus has done for us. And so let me encourage you to humbly seek to display the power of God in your life. Humbly seek to display the difference that Jesus Christ has made for you so that others can look at you and see the evidence of your life and be astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, finally this morning, let's see the transition that happens in Paul's ministry leadership. As Pastor Mike mentioned last week, there's a transition that happens at the end of chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 13, where the apostle Peter, who had played the prominent role up to this point in the book of Acts, gives way now to the apostle Paul, who kind of takes up that prominent role and will hold it to the end of the book. And we see this happen in actually a subtle sort of way throughout chapter 13 and during this first missionary journey. Notice how in verse 1, Barnabas is mentioned first in this list of church leaders that, they were, that were there in Antioch, and then followed at the very end by Saul. Then in verse 2, we see them listed as Barnabas and Saul. Then again in verse 7, it's Barnabas first and Saul second. But then after Saul started to go by the name of Paul in verse 9, from that moment forward, Paul takes up the primary position of leadership. So that verse 13 now says, now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos. And then finally in verse 43, which we'll see next week, we see Paul listed first and Barnabas listed second. Now what's interesting in this transition for Paul into ministry leadership is that it truly happened slowly and over a long period of time. Remember Paul's conversion back in chapter 9, that after that he spent three years in the region of Damascus and Arabia. Then after a short visit down to Jerusalem, he went up to Tarsus, where he spent nine years, until Barnabas went and got him, and then he comes over to Antioch for roughly two years. And so we know and we think about the Apostle Paul as this amazing man who planted many churches during these three missionary journeys, and then he wrote 13 of the letters that we have in our New Testaments today. And yet it took 14 years of God preparing his heart and molding this man into the person he wanted him to become before moving him into this position of ministry leadership. Remember also during our journey through the book of Exodus that Moses went down and lived in Midian for 40 years before God called him to go and lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. Friends, don't think everything has to happen today. For God is equipping you right now with everything good through the situations and the circumstances that you are going through in order to prepare you for the very things that he wants to do in you and through you. The benediction that we see in Hebrews chapter 13 is actually praying this very prayer. It says, now may the God of peace equip you with everything good. 
that you may do his will. Friends, you may not be in the place or in the relationship you desire to be in right now. You may not be doing the work or the ministry that you desire to do right now. But believe that your God is sovereign over your life that he is equipping you right now with everything good that you need to do the very things that he desires to do through you. Just as he did in Paul in chapter 13. In those seasons of waiting, hold tight to the Lord. Study well and consistently his word, the scriptures. Pray often. Develop deep relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. Serve him well and as wide as you can. And then wait for him to make clear, more clear, his will for you. For as that benediction from Hebrews 13 ends, it declares this very promise. That God is working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, give us a heart that is driven for and motivated by the very things that you desire and are passionate for your glory, your worship, through the redemption of your people. May it be said of us that we are a church that seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Prepare us and equip us with what we need to live to that very end. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's respond in worship, desiring to see God glorified in the way that